you tell us a little bit about Dice? Um, basically, this was, um, it was sort of kind of honed down after we had started doing a lot of our early investigations. Mm -hmm. We figured out pretty quick that some things worked and some things didn't. And it, it came pretty obvious early on that if you could sort of get the ghosts to play along with you, if you could get them interacting with you, things tend to escalate and they would get better and better and better and better. And you could listen to the audio and even watch the video and see, you know, hour one, nothing. Hour two, maybe a class C EVP. Hour three, two or three EVPs and maybe a glimpse of something weird, you know. And so it just, it was like the more that you sort of work with uh, the spirits there, the more they would work with you. So we just sort of came up with dice, which was basically we detect the ghosts, then we start to interact with them. And then, of course, capture what's going on and then escalate it as much as we can. And that's sort of our, our basic philosophy and that's how we work. Uh, just, and then you're sort of repeating it because you're, you know, you're escalating it and you're escalating it. Meanwhile, you're trying to detect more activity. You're trying to interact with that activity and capture it. You know, so it's, it's dice, but it's D-I-C-E, D-I-C-E, D you're repeating. But it's been a great approach for us and I recommend it for anyone that's, you know, just trying to get um, evidence captured. Um, well, tell us about your team. Uh, what skills and expertise do they bring to an investigation? Well, my team is basically two people. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it's Mike Elsman and my brother, Brandon Del Rosa, who's now in the Army, so we've been a man short while he's going through his training. Um, you know, his expertise is, uh, he keeps me level-headed. He sort of keeps me in check. He's you know, if I think some, it's, it's always great to have a second pair of ears and eyes that you can trust. And I think that's it more than anything because so many ghost groups out there just want to have a big presence. And so they get 30, 40, 50 members, 60 members, but they may not know half of those people personally. And you're taking them into a situation where if they have a personal experience, well, you have to trust these people. When they come to you and say, you know, I just saw a woman walking on the second floor, you can't have any doubts in your mind that what they're saying is true. Mm -hmm. I've known Mike since I was in junior high school. I've known him, you know, pretty much my entire adult life. So I trust anything that he says. So if he comes to me and he tells me, I just saw an apparition, I know he just saw an apparition. So more than anything, it's about having people around you that you trust, their, their judgment, and what they're saying is actually true because you can waste a lot of time uh, acting on bad information, uh, running around in the wrong spot, um, and doing things like that. So really, and, and the other part of that is also, is the smaller the team, the less your chance of contamination. You know, when you go in with 30, 40 people into an investigation, well, you have 34 people talking. Mm. And at any given moment, two of them are probably cutting up with each other. <laughs> and pushing and laughing and smoking a cigarette and sharing a drink or something. Well, all that's coming out on the audio. When you're sitting in that room listening to that audio recording and you can hear people in the background, the voices are very low, and you, you don't know, is that one of my 30 people and 20 of them I really don't even know them except their name? Uh, it could be, you know. So how can you 100% say you've caught an, an EVP? You can't, you know. But with two people and only one person's talking and you're doing noise discipline and you trust their judgment and their eyes and their ears, that's, an, that's a reasonable investigation. Yeah. Uh, well, what criteria do you follow when you're approached with a request for an investigation of a, of a building or a structure or place? Well, I don't think we have any criteria as far as the place is concerned because it's, it's been my experience, especially from writing the Ghost Hunters Field Guide because in so many places, that any place can be haunted apparently. Mm -hmm. Everything from uh, a stretch of woods to a state park, a lot of the Civil War battlefields, for instance, um, hotels, homes, you know. So there's really no criteria for us as far as the location itself. The criteria we place on ourselves as a group is to sort of abide by the house rules. Um, and I think that that's another big mistake that beginning ghost hunter groups can make. Um, when you go to a location, there's the obvious stuff. You know, if they say don't go in this area, well, don't go in that area. You know, or if they say, um, don't string cameras all over the house, use portable ones, well then use portable ones. You know, those are the obvious rules, but also it's about um, abiding by their sort of their belief system. You know, if I go into a home 
and they tell me that there are practicing Muslims, for instance, well, I'm not going to go push a bunch of Christian, Christian propaganda on them because it's useless to tell a Muslim resident, uh, well, just call on Christ to help you, you know? <laughs> well, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, they don't believe in Christ. So, you know, so we don't do anything religious and we, and we abide by their religion. If they say in our religion there's no such thing as this and that and this, when well, we take that in stride and just sort of just bring them the evidence that we catch. Because I think so many people come in and push their own philosophy on the resident, and that really makes no sense. I mean, um, you personally as a ghost hunter can be religious and believe in God and believe in Jesus or Muhammad or whomever, but you don't necessarily have to push that on the client when you're showing them the evidence, just show them the evidence, you know, and abide by their beliefs. Don't don't intrude upon their belief systems by coming in pushing off your own your own thing on them. Um, do you ever do you interview the people who, who own the haunted structure to figure out if they're crazy or is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. things. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I don't know if we would ever declare a, res, a a client crazy. That might not be good for us, for our reputation. But um, absolutely. Well, I mean, the more information that you're armed with, the better. And what better piece of information than someone who lives in the location? You know, uh, it's it's pretty amazing how quick you know people can overlook the obvious. Um, it's great to go and get historical research and. You know, you know, like George Brumder here and Sam Pick. You know, it's great to say, okay, I'm armed with those names, and if I, you know, hear a male voice, I can try to see if that's one of those guys. But it's even better, you know, to talk to the people who are there all the time, and they say, look, every night something happens in that room. Well, that's great information because now we can sort of zero in on that room, and it's, I think it's really as basic as that. You know, you go, you hear where the things are happening, and you concentrate on those places and you'll come away with a much higher percentage chance of capturing evidence than you would have if you just went in and you, you're like, don't tell me anything about the house, and you're trying to cover, a, like this place, three-story home with, you know, how many rooms are here, 27, 28 or something, probably? And trying to cover that many rooms, you know, all night is just almost impossible, especially if you're working with a very small team and you're using noise discipline and all of that. So the more information you have, the better. So our, our thing is, uh, you know, listen to the client, um, not necessarily think of them as crazy. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and sort of just uh, use that information to help key in on great places to investigate. Well, like I said before, the, the key is, is sort of interaction, um, and it can be as basic as EVP work, um, but it can also be as complicated as uh, using what we call instigators. And what it is is, is things like you know table tipping, uh, mock seances, pendulums are great. Pendulums are actually the most overlooked great basic tool that you can use. Um, you know, it's usually a, a heavy object hanging from a string. Um, as long as you're controlling the air current in the room and it's not moving on its own, you know, it's, it's easy to say, hey, come over and push that pendulum, you know, push that pendulum, you know, and get it going. And if you really, there's another version of that where you can put a uh, sort of hurricane around it. Mm -hmm. um, and they call that an Irish wind chime. Um, so you have even less chance of it being air hitting it, that sort of thing. But, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of controversy with a lot of the instigators, so to speak, like table tipping, Ouija boards. Uh, dowsing rods, all these things come with their own bit of controversy. I thought I heard a, a voice over here beside me. Yes. <laughs> Did anybody hear something? Did you hear it? Mm -hmm. That's really weird. Okay. There you go. We're interacting. We're talking about you. All right. <laughs> so um, while they do come with some controversy, I think you, have, you just look at it once again as a neutral investigator. You know, you're, don't prejudice the, the product. Um, a Ouija board's made by Parker Brothers or Hasbro, whomever owns the, the copyright now. It's a piece of cardboard and plastic. Is it magic? No. Is it uh, demonic or anything? Like no. It's a piece of cardboard and plastic. You know what it is? It's exactly what you think it is. And in that sense, it's a great tool just because 
for instance, if you say we're investigating um, an area where perhaps the bulk of the people died during, say, the age of spiritualism, they'd be very familiar with that object. So you're pulling out a device that they will recognize and say, oh no, you know, ooh, it's the magic Ouija board. I will have to respond now. So it's, it's just one way to instigate uh, the, the, act, the activity to happen, you know. It's not magic by any, at least we don't believe it's, it's magic by any means, but it's, a lot of times it's a great way just to get them to play with you. Um, but honestly, you don't even have to mess with the Ouija board. I say the best two things to do is the table tipping sessions and a pendulum. Those two, and you know, tables are everywhere you're going to go, and a pendulum is a string with a, with a, usually a crystal or a rock hanging from it. So it packs right inside your gear bag. It's real easy.